um, so we can put this on the cloud. Uh, but it's eight o'clock, so I want to introduce, I, I want to make sure this is nice and, um, you know, on time because I know you guys are, have things to do and places to go and people to see and families to take care of. But uh, uh, Dr. Brian Werner is my partner in orthopedic sports medicine. He's actually, uh, he's been a friend of mine for a long time, and he's really taken over the shoulder, complex shoulder uh, practice here in Charlottesville. He and Steve Brockmeyer manage most of our complex uh, shoulder, especially arthritis. And so this is a really a great topic because I think that people in the community hear so much about hip and knee arthritis and hip and knee replacement, but I really think that one of the great growing fields in orthopedics is shoulder replacement surgery. It used to be, oh, uh, it's just your shoulder, you know, we can scope it, we can do a cuff, we can debride it. But now more and more patients are turning to arthroplasty options for rotator cuff deficiency and for um, glenohumeral joint arthritis. And so I think Brian's gonna, he's really an expert in this area. He's actually helped develop a lot of the implants we use for shoulder replacement. So I know a lot of you all rehab his, his patients. And so without further ado, I want to introduce my friend and, and partner, Dr. Brian Warner. He's gonna talk about shoulder replacement in the past, the present, and the future. And, and, and I will say that uh, please, you can post your questions into the chat or you can wait at the end and just turn your video on and ask Brian questions directly. He likes to talk and he likes to answer questions. So uh, feel free to make this as interactive as you'd like. But uh, Brian, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thanks, Winston. Welcome, everybody. Um, you know, thanks for taking some time out to, to, to talk tonight. Like Winston said, I do love questions. I just have the question thing minimized, Winston. So if a question comes across, um, and it seems like a good time to do it. Just uh, please interrupt me. I'm more than I'll happy. keep ta I'll keep tabs on it. So just ask questions away. Go for it, guys. Appreciate it. Um, so for you, those of you that don't know me, I'm a assistant professor at UVA in, in sports medicine and shoulder surgery. I did a fellowship in shoulder surgery at the HSS in New York City, um, and then I also double as the the head team physician for JMU. So I, I, I do a lot of stuff out in uh, Harrisonburg as well. Um, and so like Winston mentioned, this is a, a talk about shoulder replacement, kind of give you a little bit of history of shoulder replacement, um, then talk about the two types of shoulder replacement. So anatomic shoulder replacement, reverse shoulder replacement, try to focus a lot on kind of what brings patients in, why we do shoulder replacement um, and, and how patients do after shoulder replacements. Let's see if I can make my slide advance, perfect. So just um, with any talk there are, um, you know, I do have some disclosures. Um, I, I do a lot of research and in, in order to get funding for research and be able to kind of move the science forward, particularly in the field of shoulder replacements, I do interface with a lot of companies and do do implant design for shoulder replacement. So um, those are my disclosures. Doesn't really affect this talk at all, but um, important to mention. Um, so just kind of starting at the beginning is uh, shoulder arthritis. It's a, a really common cause of, of disability. Um, we, we see lots of patients with it and, and kind of, you know, 10, 15 years ago was kind of something that was, you know, more often ignored. Um, and now it's something that we really focus on. When I see a patient, the first thing I'm looking for, instead of their rotator cuff or their labrum, I'm looking to see how much arthritis they have just to get an idea of kind of what the status of their shoulder is as far as degeneration, and then kind of moving forward with all the other things that can go on. And so for someone that sees a, a high volume of degenerative problems in the shoulder like I do, arthritis is where I start, and then I kind of work away from that when I'm evaluating the patient. Um, there are a lot of different types of arthritis, and when we the knee, I really think kind of wear and tear arthritis and then when the joint space wears out, we talk about a replacement for it. Um, in the shoulder, there's a lot of different types and they, they all kind of impact patients differently. Standard osteoarthritis is very common, um, but we do shoulder replacements and talk to patients about arthroplasty for lots of other reasons. Probably the second most common reason is um, rotator cuff problems. And so patients with long-standing rotator cuff tears um, can develop a form of arthritis associated with a rotator cuff tear called uh, rotator cuff tear arthropathy. We also see a fair amount of inflammatory arthritis in the shoulder. Rheumatoid arthritis is very commonly manifest in the shoulder, a lot less than probably used to be seen due to the, the good kind of medical management of rheumatoid arthritis, but it does come across frequently. And then something that we see a lot in the shoulder that you don't quite see as often the hip or the knee is post-traumatic arthritis. There are lots of patients that get proximal humerus fractures. A lot of those do go on to heal well but there is a significant percentage of them that either don't heal well or over time develop post-traumatic arthritis. And so that's a very growing field and kind of area for a reason for shoulder replacements. Um, it's just a basic graphic showing um, you know, standard glenohumeral arthritis, but the main findings that we see are kind of depicted here on the side. Um, you lose your joint space, the capsule around the shoulder becomes very contracted, and then the cartilage itself kind of erodes over time. You get a very irregular surface. The nerve endings, what causes pain is that the nerve endings are typically in a healthy shoulder covered by cartilage. And so once that cartilage goes away, 
you have bone rubbing against bone, um, and those nerve endings and that can be very, are, are then kind of manifested in the shoulder and it can become very painful for patients. Um, the other thing that they'll get is these very irregular surfaces. Um, they lose the ability to rotate the shoulder. And a lot of people with glenohumeral arthritis, kind of standard glenohumeral arthritis, will still have the ability to maintain forward elevation of their shoulder. But what they'll notice is that they'll lose their ability to internally and externally rotate, or they'll feel significant crepitus with it. And so those are kind of, sign of some of the early signs that they may be dealing with arthritis and not something that we see more commonly like rotator cuff problems. I like history a lot. I know Winston does too. So I always like to include a few history slides when I'm doing talks. Um, and so shoulder arthroplasty um, has undergone a lot of changes in um, you know, the last decade, but certainly over the last hundred years, it's changed a lot. This is a picture of the first shoulder replacement that ever went into a human being. It's in 1893. Um, and like a lot of things in orthopedics, it was developed for tuberculosis, which was a big problem in prior centuries. Um, and so joint replacements, that's kind of where they started with tuberculosis. Um, not a lot happened with shoulder replacements until the 1950s. And so there really wasn't a lot of good options. The 1950s, um, Nier started with what, what a hemiarthroplasty, where that is just a partial shoulder replacement, um, and found that patients got a lot better. And compared to all the stuff that had been done in the prior kind of 50 to 60 years, um, it, it was a huge advancement. Um, and then kind of the first real modern shoulder replacement prosthesis was in the 1970s. And so when you think about how long patients have had arthritis for, you know, shoulder replacements have really only been around for a short period of time. Um, and then there's been a lot of no, more modern advancements kind of in stem design and, and head design and the type of plastic and how you fixate things. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but the 1970s is really when shoulder replacements started to take off. The challenge was is that there was a competing camp of um, uh, surgeons who felt that there was a better way to do shoulder replacements. And so what, uh, what were, were termed constrained implants are very popular. What constrained implants, you think of them almost like a hinge, instead of just having a ball and socket that can kind of freely move around, um, the ball and the socket were more firmly linked to each other. And there's a whole group of, of surgeons that really felt that that was better. The challenge with that is it puts a lot of stress on the bone around the implant. And so it really gave shoulder replacements a bad name for a while. In the 1980s, finally the camp with the more kind of fluid shoulder replacements, more modern type of shoulder replacements won out. And then um, surgeons started focusing on optimizing other things like the, the, the sockets and the way we fix things and type of screws and that sort of thing. Um, shoulder replacement took a big change in the kind of early 1990s in France. That was when a guy named Grimont, um, a, a surgeon that's really revolutionized how we do shoulder replacement, um, started working on the first modern reverse shoulder replacement. And that's pictured over there on the, the right. Um, while reverse shoulder replacements have become very common, um, they really haven't been around all along the United States. So the FDA first approved reverse shoulder replacements in 2003 really didn't start getting an implant in the United States in earnest until 2004. Um, and then over the past kind of decade, it's exploded. And so nationwide, if you look at kind of large registry studies, about 60% of all shoulder replacements that go in, in the United States are reverse shoulder replacements. In my practice here in Charlottesville, it's probably closer to 70%. And, and so part of that is the type of pathology that I deal with. Part of it is the advancements in the technology that reverse shoulder replacements allow us to do a lot more allow patients to rehab quicker and we don't have to rely quite as much on the rotator cuff for um, you know, rehabbing and getting function back. And so we'll talk about indications for reverse, but it's really taken over the field. Um, and as long as it's done well, the, you know, the complication rates are pretty low. Um, so symptoms of shoulder arthritis mimic a lot of other shoulder problems. And so it's often hard to clinically diagnose mild or moderate arthritis. Patients have pain, but there's a lot of things that can cause pain in the shoulder. One of the hallmarks is stiffness or limited range of motion, particularly in rotation, like I was talking about. So internal rotation, external rotation. When patients have severe limitations in that and you've ruled out other things like adhesive capsulitis, other problems that can cause that, um, you know, shoulder arthritis should be suspected. Um, patients will often talk about swelling. It's often difficult to really ascertain swelling about the shoulder unless they really have a remarkable effusion. Um, tenderness can be present, but it's often nonspecific. And so while I do palpate patient shoulders, I typically don't read a whole lot into, um, you know, tenderness to palpation in a certain area. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen pain in the shoulder is often referred to the, the lateral side of the shoulder. And so the location of the pain doesn't always give away what the actual diagnosis is. Patients will almost uniformly report some kind of crepitus or catching or grinding. A lot of that can be due to how severe the arthritis is and then also the presence of osteophytes. You can see in this picture here, a large inferior humeral osteophyte, particularly with rotation when they try to reach behind their back or across their chest, that can rub along the glenoid and, or the rotator cuff um, and cause a significant amount of symptoms. 
Weakness or giving way can be for a couple of reasons. It can be due to the fact that their rotator cuff gets weak um, because they're not using the shoulder as much and they're guarding. It also can be due to rotator cuff tearing. In general, patients with primary glenohumeral arthritis, like the pic patient pictured on the right there, um, they do not have a high incidence of rotator cuff tears or at least symptomatic ones. About five to 10% of patients will have it. And so if we see weakness, we start worrying that maybe it's not just primary glenohumeral arthritis, that it's rotator cuff tear arthropathy or that something else is going on. And so if there is weakness along with shoulder arthritis, we'll often work it up further with um, you know, MRI or some other advanced imaging. And so how do we treat arthritis? Um, well, although it's not great for my business, it is the right thing to do for patients. I really insist on a, a pretty extensive course of non-operative management because um, the, the joke I like to tell patients, and you've probably heard it before, is that we don't walk on our shoulders. And so while people with heat, knee, knee and hip arthritis, um, they tend to manifest their symptoms quicker and progress to arthroplasty faster. Um, that's because they're walking on those joints all the time. Patients can get by for a long period of time with pretty significant glenohumeral arthritis and not need a replacement because they can modify their activities, they can get occasional injections, and they don't walk on their shoulders. And so you're not loading the joint the same way that you're loading the, the hip or the knee. Um, physical therapy can be helpful. If it's a patient that I think is imminently about to have a shoulder replacement, I will not send them to therapy or I'll try to avoid it because I want them to save their visits afterwards. And I think that's a bigger bang for their buck. Um, but for patients with mild to moderate arthritis, physical therapy, in particular capsular stretching, working on getting the rotator cuff strong can be helpful and certainly can make their recovery from a shoulder replacement much easier for them once they learn the exercise and they're used to their therapist and used to going to therapy. Um, there's actually one or two insurance companies, um, major ones now that are um, requiring a physical therapy visit before they'll approve a shoulder replacement. And so uh, I could give a whole other talk about why I agree or disagree with that. Um, but uh, they either require a visit with a therapist or a therapist to say that they don't feel that they can help them. And so you'd, some of you may have gotten that request from me. Um, if it's a patient with end stage arthritis who's failed you know, 15 injections in their shoulder, um, at that point, I really want them to save their insurance paid physical therapy visits for post-operatively. And so you may get a note from me that says, you please evaluate the patient. If you think they would you know, benefit from post-operative therapy, please indicate that um, so that we can get their shoulder replaced and get them back to you so that we can use the therapy to stretch them out, get them strong and get them to a point where they're happy with their shoulder. Over-the-counter medications can be very helpful. I, you know, if the patients can tolerate the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, I always try that. Supplements I'm kind of plus or minus on. So, um, you know, glucosamine, my statement about glucosamine um, is that it, it doesn't cost a lot of money. And so if a patient sees some benefit in it, I'm fine with them trying it. Um, but there's not a lot of good literature to support that it makes a tremendous amount of difference. And so if a patient wants to try it, I'm fine with it. It doesn't cost much money, um, but I, I'm not overly optimistic about it changing, certainly modifying their disease or, or delaying their need for an arthroplasty. Injections are a mainstay of treatment uh, for shoulder arthritis. And I typically insist that every patient has at least one because often patients are very surprised and then I can buy them a couple more years before they have an arthroplasty. The typical injection that we'll use is a steroid injection. For glenohumeral arthritis, when they have an intact rotator cuff, which is a large majority of these patients, um, that should be a guided injection. So that either needs to be x-ray guided or ultrasound guided. Um, the, the glenohumeral joint itself is very low and studies how often you hit it and it's less than 20% of the time if you do it blind. And so even patients who've come in with an injection, maybe done by their family medicine doctor, um, if it wasn't a guided injection, I'll often still insist that they try a guided one because they'll often be surprised. Um, I put this thing about Zoretta in here. You may see that drug and some patients have had it. That's a long acting steroid um, that has a lot of good literature in the knee that um, I've started using more frequently with patients for their knees. Um, we're about to start a clinical trial looking at that in the shoulder. And so that may be something where we can buy patients a longer period of time in between injections or more relief. Um, so more coming on that in the future. Hyaluronic acid is something that we talked a lot about in the knee, you know, a decade ago. Um, it's expensive. Insurance companies don't like paying for it. We fortunately or unfortunately were part of a study here looking at DHA injections in the shoulder and, and really didn't find them to be efficacious. And, and so that's really not a part of my practice. There are some patients that swear by it. Um, I've seen one or two patients recently that were part of the trial a decade ago at UVA and really liked it. And so there could be a role for it, but it's very difficult to get insurance approved it. And so it's not really part of my algorithm. The final drug that uh, injection that people like to talk about for arthritis is uh, PRP or platelet rich plasma. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about it. So you draw some blood, you spin it down, you get the platelet rich portion of it and inject it back into the joint. Um, the, the problem with PRP is that there's a misconception that it will heal the shoulder or maybe reverse the process of arthritis. 
Um, and so that's not the case for PRP. PRP is not a stem cell injection. It, it's something that is a powerful anti-inflammatory. Um, it's not a steroid. And so you're not quite as worried about damage to surrounding structures like cartilage or tendon. Um, it is not frequently something I use because insurance companies don't cover it. Um, it's a cash and you know five, 600 bucks at UVA to get a PRP injection. It is something that I use occasionally. Um, I don't often recommend it, but say a 40 year old patient with moderate arthritis, not dying to do a shoulder replacement, I'm there looking for every option. If it's something that they're financially able to afford it, there is some reasonable literature that they can get reasonable relief from it without having any of the side effects of steroid injections. And so I certainly have had a couple of patients who like it, but it's also quite, you know, the initial injection is much more painful for patients. So I've had one or two patients who are pretty unhappy that they got it. And so it's something you hear about, I hear a lot about a lot more when I was in New York here in Charlottesville, it's not as big a thing, but um, definitely exists. So if none of those things work, shoulder replacement might be the answer. And so we'll, we'll talk about shoulder replacements now. Um, so shoulder replacement overall is the third most commonly replaced joint. Um, knee and hip are obviously most common, but it, it's, it's actually a common problem. Up to 20% of the overall population in the United States over the age of 65 has some degree of shoulder arthritis. Um, and so I think part of the reason why a lot of shoulder replacements weren't done historically is that we just weren't good at it. We weren't looking for it. Um, and that the implants probably weren't at a place where the outcomes were satisfactory. And so as implant design has improved, rehab has improved for it, our understanding of shoulder replacements has improved, um, you're going to see more and more shoulder replacements over the next decade. Um, some of these numbers are almost staggering, but the, the demand for shoulder arthroplasty is expected to increase almost 800 um, percent between 2011 and 2030. And so, you know, we're 10, 10 years into that prediction and I've already seen a lot of that happen. And so we're probably looking at another kind of, you know, 300% increase in shoulder replacement demand um, over the next decade. And so we only have two surgeons at UVA doing it um, and it, it ends up taking over your life pretty quickly. There's a lot of patients that benefit from it and then they have friends who've benefited from it. So they want to get it done. Um, and then uh, it just keeps on going and going. So um, we do a lot of them um, and I expect that will continue to increase. Um, so the basics of shoulder arthroplasty, just kind of understanding, and again, this is for anatomic shoulder replacement. Uh, I have some slides about reverse shoulder replacement after this. Um, and so historically, shoulder replacement was an inpatient procedure. Even five years ago, every patient that I saw got admitted to the hospital for a minimum of 24 hours and then went home. In fact, Medicare insists that that happens. What we found in some of our advancements in anesthesia, and particularly the type of nerve blocks we do, is that we've completely changed that pathway. So both uh, Dr. Brockmeyer and myself, our pathway is now that patients go home the same day of surgery, whether they're done at the inpatient OR or at the outpatient OR. And the main reason for that is the introduction of a new nerve block. The drug is called Expirel. Um, it lasts on average for about three days for patients. And so this happened over the course of about six months to a year where we go and round on the patients the next morning and every patient asks you the same question is, why am I in the hospital? My arm is still numb. My roommate next to me kept me up all night. I could have done this at home easily. And so unless the patient has significant medical problems, has a problem with anesthesia, their block didn't work perfectly, we're prepping most patients to go home unless they, you know, there's a reason not to. And a lot of that's due to improvements in anesthesia. And so that's been a, a huge advent for us. And honestly, it's improved patient satisfaction a lot because they don't have to spend that night in the hospital. Even for Medicare, where they, they insist that they have a period of observation, we do that period of observation in the recovery room. And then if they're feeling up to it, they go home. And so for anatomic shoulder replacement, it's a, a metal on polyethylene articulation. And so the humerus is resurfaced with metal. You'll see if you ever see the x-rays of your patients. Um, I kind of was thinking while I was putting this talk together, you guys probably don't see a ton of x-rays of your patients. So if you ever want to see x-rays of someone you're rehabbing, just shoot me an email, let me know. Happy to send you a screenshot of it. Um, stems have changed a lot. And so the humerus, the ball is metal and that stayed very consistent. But what's happened over the past decade, even five years, that the stems keep getting shorter and shorter to the point where both Dr. Brockmeyer and myself do a lot of stemless arthroplasty now, where it's just basically a metal cap that goes on top of the ball with no stem going down the arm bone. Um, that's been really helpful for patients. And the socket is made out of plastic. There's a, a lot of different appearances of the sockets, but plastic has been pretty consistent. Um, that's usually fixed with cement. So like I said, uh, it's an outpatient or 24 hot hour hospital stay. I'd say probably 75% of my patients are now going home the same day, even if I do them at the main OR. With the remaining 25% either being someone who had their other side done and is kind of attached to the idea, or as medical comorbidities, we need to observe them. It takes about two hours to do the surgery. That's from skin to skin. The actual, you know, once you've made incision and kind of dissected in there, to actually do a shoulder replacement that goes well, it takes about an hour. 
Um, then the, the closure might take another kind of half hour afterwards. But um, there are some things that make it more challenging, in particularly large muscular men. Um, they have really big pec muscles, really big deltoid muscles. They're usually pretty contracted. They'll take a little bit longer. Um, but it, it's not a bad operation. It's honestly quicker than a big rotator cuff and um, um, really minimal blood loss. One of the other big advances has been a drug that we can give at the time of anesthesia that really reduces our blood loss. And so I've never done a blood transfusion on a shoulder replacement patient. And I don't anticipate that happening unless we have a bad complication. Um, we like for the patients to wear a sling post-op. Currently, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of our patients. We just have one rehab protocol for both reverse and anatomic shoulders. That rehab pro protocol is designed to protect our anatomic shoulders. And so for an anatomic shoulder replacement, you have to remove the, the subscap. So the rotator cuff tendon in the front, you have to either peel or cut or take a little sliver of bone and remove that, do the shoulder replacement, then repair that back down. For an anatomic shoulder replacement, it is absolutely crucial that that subscapularis heals. If it doesn't heal, the shoulder replacement will escape out the front. They'll have a very predictable poor function, increasing pain. They won't be happy with it. Um, and so that entire rehab protocol with wearing a sling and avoiding, you know, passive external rotation and active internal rotation are all to protect the subscap. However, and we'll talk about a little bit more with reverses, um, that is actually an overprotective protocol for reverse shoulder replacements. I do repair my subscaps after reverse shoulder replacements because I think it improves their internal rotation a little bit, but it really doesn't matter if, it repaired, if, if the repair heals or not. Um, and so my best reverse shoulder replacements are my patients who come in without a sling at two weeks. And I've had patients who have already been raking leaves two weeks after a, a reverse shoulder replacement and quite happy with it. And so um, we're doing that because we never know exactly which therapist our patients are going to. But if you have someone who you feel like who had a reverse shoulder replacement and you know that that's what they had and you want to move them along quicker in their rehab, um, they'll, they'll thank you later. Physical therapy, and I, I put this in capital letters, it's absolutely crucial for the optimal outcome, particularly for an anatomic shoulder replacement. All I've done when I do an anatomic shoulder replacement is I've removed arthritis and given them a smooth joint. I've done nothing to get their strength back. Most of these patients are pretty debilitated at the time that they come in for shoulder replacement because they've gotten progressively worse shoulder, worse shoulder arthritis. Like I said, they usually have multiple injections before they get to the point of having a shoulder replacement. Um, and so their rotator cuff and deltoid muscle are completely shut down. And then we do a surgery on top of that and we give them a nerve block that knocks out their muscles for a period of time. And so without therapy, an anatomic shoulder replacement will have good pain relief, but absolutely horrible function. Um, and so they do tend to get stiff. And so stretching them out afterwards is important, but really it takes a while to get rotator cuff function back. You'll hit some home runs and get patients who figure it out really quickly and really are diligent about a home exercise program. But in general, the average patient with an anatomic shoulder replacement really, really needs therapy to stretch them out and get their rotator cuff working again. And um, so what is recovery like? We talked a little bit about this. It's obviously changed a lot. I mean, 15 years ago sounds like a long time ago, but it's really, you know, not that long ago. Patients were spending a few weeks in the hospital after a shoulder replacement. And now I'm telling you that at least 25% of my patients are completely done at our outpatient surgery center. So not even in the main OR, they're done at our outpatient surgery center, the same place that we do knee scopes and ACLs. And they're in and out, having surgery, going home an hour after surgery, starting therapy the next day. And so things have changed a lot. I'd say our average hospitalization is probably a day, um, but even over the you know even over the last six months, it's you know the majority are going home the same day as surgery. The big thing that's helped, and it's really been two things. Part of it is us educating patients, and from the start saying this is an outpatient procedure. You can go home. You can take care of this on your own. Go see your therapist right away. Start stretching it out. Start moving your shoulder. And then anesthesia has really helped with this, having a, a block that lasts for a while and really having a multimodal approach to pain, including anti-inflammatories and Tylenol, ice machines, all these other different things that could help them manage their pain. Um, these are some of my favorite patients to see back in two weeks because a lot of them aren't even taking pain medicine you see them back in two weeks. They're just so happy not to have arthritis that they feel better. Um, you'll get some variable um, you know, opinions on when to start therapy. Um, this post-op day one therapy um, thing is, is from when we would admit them to the hospital. We'd have a therapist come by and kind of show them some stuff in the sling and some, some basic exercises. Um, I personally like my patients to see a therapist at least once before they come back to see me in clinic. I think that's very helpful so they're not so terrified of their shoulder. They're kind of motivated. It keeps them doing their home exercise a little bit. Um, and I don't worry about um, my shoulder replacements as much as people probably historically did. Um, I, you know, I, I need to find some wood to knock on. My, my rate of, of subscap failure is exceedingly low. Um, I think my rate of stiffness and um, that sort of thing is, is higher. 
And so I, I like patients to really see somebody, have them start to get them out of the sling, move your elbow, move your wrist, start doing some forward elevation passively and get the shoulder moving a little bit. And so I really like them to see a therapist. And I, I give them a therapy script on the day of surgery and really encourage them to do that. I think most of them do. Um, most patients um, do go home. I know with hip and knee arthritis you know, and arthroplasty, you'll see a lot of patients that go to rehab facilities. Pretty unusual for shoulder replacement. Most insurance companies won't, uh, won't pay for that. So here's just a case with standard shoulder replacement. This is kind of everything that we see in shoulder arthritis. Um, this AP view of the shoulder, the kind of hallmarks of shoulder arthritis. I uh, hope you can see my mouse. Winston, tell me if you can. Um, but you have this, this large osteophyte or bone spur that sits off the, um, the inferior humerus. That's kind of a hallmark of advanced arthritis. This is regular glenohumeral arthritis. And so they have a reasonable amount of space above their humerus before they reach their chromium. That's where their rotator cuff sits. So like I said, with regular, regular glenohumeral arthritis, pretty low rate of rotator cuff problems to that standard. The diagnostic view is this axillary x-ray where they shoot an x-ray up through their armpit and it highlights how bad the arthritis is. While in this view on the front, you can see there is some space between the ball and the socket. This axillary view here, you can see bone rubbing against bone very significantly. This is a very common pattern of arthritis we can see. This is the front of the shoulder here, back of the shoulder is back here where the humerus is falling. Basically the humerus starts to subluxate posteriorly and they get preferential wear of the back of their socket. And so when we see it this advanced, we know they're gonna be pretty symptomatic and they're gonna have really limited range of motion um, because their humerus is halfway, you know, not dislocated, but subluxated the back of their shoulder and so they can't rotate whatsoever. Um, and so this is really hard to stretch a patient through this or, or, or to do anything other than arthroplasty if injections aren't helping them um, to get them normal function back to their shoulder. This is our typical positioning setup at UVA. And so um, you can do shoulder replacements with them laying flat. You can do shoulder replacements with them sitting up. Uh, both Dr. Brockmer and I do this the same way with them sitting up just to keep it consistent. Uh, it's a delta pectoral incision. So an angle incision in the front of the shoulder something about seven centimeters long. Um, I'm a really a fan of small incisions. Um, I, don't, I don't know why it, it makes me struggle sometimes, but do the same thing for knees and shoulders. I try to keep it as small as I can. Patients do seem to like it. These incisions heal great. And so um, they usually it's pretty rare that you have a wound complaint. This little arm positioning holder helps us kind of position the arm in, in different places while we're working on the, the humeral side and while we're working on the socket side. Um, it does require a team. You need someone to stay in the back and hold some retractors while you're doing it. Um, but it's, uh, you know, th this setup works really, really well for us. This is what that same patient's shoulder looks like afterwards. And you can see the metal ball here. Um, this is a, a shorter stem. And so if you look at some traditional shoulder replacements, you'll see stems that go halfway down their, their humerus. Um, this is a kind of standard short stem for me. But like I said, this is probably a six month old x-ray. I've transitioned to doing a lot of patients with stemless where they just have a little tiny peg going in here. A lot of that depends on bone quality doesn't affect their rehab whatsoever, um, but certainly makes revision options a lot easier. The less bone that you violate when you do your initial shoulder replacement, if they ever have problems with it, revisions are a lot easier. Also a lower rate of kind of periprosthetic fracture or complications related to smaller stems. And so I certainly prefer to do it. You can see on this patient's axillary x-ray, um, a lot of improvement in there. They're not falling out the back of their- I'm having trouble. <laughs> Siri's talking to me. Um, and so they're, they're no longer subluxating out the back. This is their plastic sock. You can see they're really nicely. We've corrected the version of their glenoid. And so, and uh, this patient absolutely loves it. Interestingly, you can have a pretty bad looking x-ray after shoulder replacement and the patients still love it. Um, but um, I, I only like to stare at good pictures. So I really spend some time trying to make sure they look good in addition to working well for the patient. Hey, real quick, Brian. Yeah. Talk about the subscap and how do you take it down typically and what is your decision making process as far as how you take it down, how you reattach it? Um, great question. So subscap management, particularly for anatomic shoulder replacements is really important because if it doesn't heal, they're going to be unhappy. And so there's three main ways the subscap can be taken down. You can do an osteotomy. And so an osteotomy is, is you cut basically the bony attachment of the subscap, which is the lesser tuberosity on the humerus. Just take a little wafer of bone and then peel the rest of the tendon. So that's option one. Option two is a peel. And so what a peel is, instead of taking bone, you basically elevate. You basically take a knife or electric cautery and elevate the entire tendon off without a piece of bone. The final option is what's called a tenotomy, where we basically cut the tendon a little off of its attachment. Um, there are a lot of studies looking at what's best. I try to really base, you know, kind of what I do for patients, not only my own personal practice, but what's been published in the literature. Um, osteotomy and peel have equivalent outcomes and equivalent healing rates. There's one study that shows a slightly improved rate of healing with osteotomy. 
Um, but then there are several subsequent studies, including randomized controlled trials where they had peel versus osteotomy, where it's shown no difference in clinical outcomes. And so I think either a peel or an osteotomy is very reasonable. In general, for anatomic shoulder replacements, I like doing an osteotomy, except when I'm doing a stemless arthroplasty. And so the challenge with stemless arthroplasty is you need all the bone possible right around where you're going to put that humeral um, ball on top because you're not relying on a stem anymore. You're relying on the bone up in the ball. And so you don't want to violate that bone at all. Um, and so for all of my stemless arthroplasty patients, which is definitely becoming increasing in volume, I will do a peel for them. Otherwise, I do an osteotomy. Um, for reverse shoulder replacement, it's different. Um, and so for every reverse shoulder replacement myself, both Dr. Brockmeyer will always do a peel. Um, and that's to, you can get a little more length on the subscap. And so with, when you do a reverse shoulder replacement, you change the mechanics of the shoulder a little bit, the shoulder gets stretched out. And so it's impossible to repair it in that stretched out position unless you have all the length possible. And so both of us always do appeal for that and it, it seems to work pretty well. All right, continuing on. So when we do an anatomic shoulder replacement, um, although we like to mess around on the, the humeral side and, and you know, do stemless or um, stemmed arthroplasty, um, most of the innovation and most of the importance is on the glenoid side. One of the most important things is not just to you know, take a shoulder that you got some arthritis and put a socket in there. And there's certainly a lot of people around the country that do that. Correcting deformity and correcting bone loss is very important to obtaining optimal outcomes. And so if you just place the, the, the plastic socket in there in the position that the glenoid is when it's eroded halfway out the back, that patient's not going to be happy with their function afterwards. Um, and so identifying problems with the bone and then being able to correct it intraoperatively is very important. I get a CT scan on every single anatomic patient unless they absolutely refuse. Um, because then I can load up the software, I can get a 3D picture of their shoulder, and then I can actually have a 3D plan and a transfer guide that I can use um, to, to correct any kind of problems with version or inclination, anything that's going on with their glenoid, or if I need to build part of their socket back and I can do that. Um, and, and Dr. Brockmeyer is very similar in the same way that, um, you know, the, it's an operation that does well, um, but we're trying to make it perfect and uh, fixing the glenoid is perfect. Um, there's been a lot of um, implant design improvements in uh, on the glenoid side, which you guys don't need to worry quite as much about. Um, but the modern implant designs have a much better track record than what we were putting in patients 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and so a lot of the quoted kind of loosening rates, um, we're not seeing that anymore. And, and so um, it's tempting us to do these in younger patients that allow patients to do more after their shoulder replacement. Instead of don't lift anything with your shoulder, it's oh, maybe 50 pounds or maybe 75 pounds, or maybe you want to get back to working on your farm and see how it goes. And so improving the glenoid because glenoid loosening is, has been the historic problem with them um, using your shoulder replacement too much um, has allowed younger patients to have shoulder replacements. So here's just one additional case kind of example showing what we do on the socket side. This is a very young guy, so 47 year old guy with horrible shoulder arthritis. When you see this in young patients, this is typically due to untreated instability in their shoulder. And so uh, this is likely, uh, if I remember this guy correctly, he played a lot of football growing up, had a lot of shoulder dislocations, never had surgery. And so then instability no longer becomes their problem, but they can pretty rapidly develop pretty significant arthritis. It's a little hard to see on this x-ray, but he has a lot of wear in the back. And so for all these patients, like I mentioned, I do get a CT scan. So this CT scan shows kind of what his problem is. And so it's not just that he has arthritis, it's that he's worn out a lot of his socket. This red line and then the hash mark kind of shows where his socket should be. It should be relatively close to neutral. So you can see he actually worn significantly out back. And so um, he has about 20 plus degrees of retroversion. So you need to address it intraoperatively or your glenoid component's not gonna last long. Um, they're gonna, it's gonna rock on the back of the shoulder and eventually loosen. And so there's a number of ways to do this. One is to remove that bone where the yellow line is. And so you can level out his socket or the opposing ways that you can build up the back of the socket with plastic or metal or bone. And so both are very viable options. There's a lot of things that go into the decision to do that. You don't necessarily have to worry about that, but realize that shoulder replacement isn't just placing the socket on an arthritic bone. It's also trying to correct pathology to give them the best outcome. That's some stuff about how we measure it. Um, so this is that same patient. This just kind of shows you after you, you, you take him from where he has um, all of this significant wear in the back you see on the CT scan, and you leave him with a little bit of wear in the back, but you really can level out his um, glenoid pretty well. And this diagram shows how we do it. We basically, when we take our reamer, instead of just reaming it flat, we kind of angle the reamer a little bit and do what's called a high side ream. We remove some of the bone from the front of the shoulder to level it out and so that his version is more neutral. And so that's one way to address this. We'll talk about some other ways that we do it later on. 
So my post-op protocol and Dr. Brockmeyer is the same way. For an anatomic shoulder replacement, I am pretty strict about the sling. I do want them wearing it most of the time for six weeks. That is purely to protect the subscap. Um, if we didn't have to worry about subscap repair, I'd let them out of it um, a lot sooner. It said it's a, a short time in the hospital or, or same day of surgery. Um, blood clot risk, pretty low after these, but not zero. So in general, we have everyone on aspirin unless they're higher risk and we'll give them something more. I like them to start moving right away. And it, it, at some point in time, I need to take a video of one of uh, a shoulder replacement patient intraoperatively with the shoulder still open and show you that forward elevation, passive forward elevation, the shoulder really does nothing to the subscap. There's really not much tension across the subscap as you forward elevate. It's really passive external rotation when you're stretching the subscap repair or active internal rotation where they're firing their subscap um, that I worry about. But forward elevation is really safe. And so it gives something that they can start stretching out and doing. Um, and then really it, it takes a while. And so I, I do counsel patients about this. If they've had friends who've had shoulder replacements, they need to understand if it was a reverse or an anatomic because an anatomic shoulder replacement, unless you're one of the zebras, takes a while to recover because you've got to get the cuff to wake up, the deltoid to wake up. And it takes some time but it is a more normal functioning shoulder. And so the anticipation is with a good shoulder replacement and a good patient who does good rehab um, is that it, they're gonna have very good function, good external rotation. They should be able to reach around their back and get good forward elevation. So uh, the rehab is a huge component of that. Um, so moving on to reverse total shoulder. Good, I'm still good on time. Um, this is a typical reverse shoulder. Man, Siri hates me. Um, so this is a typical reverse shoulder replacement, and, and basically for those of you that, that haven't seen one or don't completely understand the concept, you reverse the articulation. And so on the socket side, we're putting a ball that's fixed with screws. There's a little plate underneath this, and the ball sits on top of it. On the uh, humeral side, you have a humeral socket, and there's a lot of different designs as far as what the angle of that socket is and um, how thick the plastic is or how the plastic is oriented. Um, but the general concept is reversing the orientation. Um, that does a couple of things, and, and not to hopefully get too technical on you, but it changes the center of rotation of the shoulder. Um, rotation of the shoulder is very important. Center of rotation is something that I've spent a lot of time doing research on, both for anatomic and reverse shoulder replacements. Um, but the shoulder is always going to rotate around the center of a sphere. Um, and so in a typical shoulder, that sphere is on the humeral side. On a reverse shoulder replacement, that sphere is over on the socket. And so it changes the center of rotation and also lengthens the arm and the deltoid somewhat. Um, and so it retensions the deltoid, changes the center of rotation, gives them the ability, hopefully, to elevate their shoulder in the absence of a functioning rotator cuff. One of the main functions of the rotator cuff, and how I like to explain it to patients, is it's kind of like a trampoline that holds the ball down the socket. Without it, the ball kind of rises up, and you shrug your shoulder, and you can't uh, get the, the ability to lift your arm up. And so reverse shoulder placement at its simplest form is just a trampoline that holds the shoulder down and allows your other muscles to lift it up. Um, and it does a really tremendous job. It, it's a life-changing procedure for a lot of patients. Don't make fun of me, Winston. It is. Um, and so the most common indication for um, reverse shoulder replacement is rotator cuff tear arthropathy. That's what it was designed for. And so that's a patient in all the case that kind of shows you pictures of it with superior migration of their humeral head due to an absent rotator cuff, and then they develop arthritis from it. Um, like I mentioned, this was developed in Europe and used for a decade or two in Europe before it came to the United States. And the first one went in kind of fourth quarter of 2003. Um, it re reverses the orientation of the shoulder replacement. And you have to imagine, I almost feel like a used car salesman a little bit, going into a patient's room who's seeing me for a torn rotary cup. And then I go in there and tell them I'm going to give them a backwards shoulder replacement. Um, and that how you can imagine how that conversation goes with patients off, oftentimes that just kind of look at you like, what the heck are you talking about? I thought my rotator cuff was torn and you're going to put a backward shoulder replacement. I mean, how the heck is that going to work? Um, and, and so it does take some time to kind of explain to patients. I try not to get too technical with them um, and then showing them videos and pictures. And we have a booklet that we try to give them. Um, it, it's amazing how most patients say sounds good and just kind of sign up to doing it. And, and when you kind of step back and think about it, it's a bizarre procedure to be offering someone, but it absolutely has changed the field of shoulder replacement surgery and changed a lot of patients' lives. I think a lot about reverse shoulder replacement, what's important, I think, and why you know, I and other people have been successful with it is really setting expectations up front about why you're doing the operation and what you're hoping to gain from the operation. And so the first thing I do in any patient's room that I'm considering a reverse arthroplasty or arthroplasty of any kind is what are you here for? I, and so I get lots of referrals of people that have arthritis or who have rotator cuff to arthropathy. Uh, I say, so, so why are you here in the office today? And if the answer is, well, 
doctor so-and-so told me that I, I need a shoulder replacement. I was like, well, no, no, what, what symptoms are you having that bring you into the office? I probably see one or two patients every clinic with end-stage rotator cuff tear arthropathy with zero pain and perfectly preserved active elevation. So that patient does not need a reverse shoulder replacement. I can't make them any better. And so I, I actually spend more time talking that patient out of an operation than I do when I have to talk someone into having a reverse shoulder replacement because someone told them they needed to have it. And so there are a certain percentage of patients with rotator cuff tear arthropathy who will compensate unbelievably well, where you can barely even tell that they have rotator cuff tear arthropathy. And so like I do for anatomic shoulder replacements, patients with, with this problem, I always do an injection first because if you can reduce their pain and then actually convince them to, to work on some deltoid isometrics and, and exercises for the shoulder, there is a certain percentage of patients that will come back in six weeks and say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I don't need a shoulder replacement anymore. Um, and, and so I always, I insist, insist, insist on doing an injection to see if they're a coper or not a coper. There's certainly a large percent of patients who are not. And so those are the patients who get shoulder replacements. Reverse shoulder replacements are fantastic at pain relief. And so there's nothing that makes me happier than seeing a person with rotator cuff tear arthropathy who says, all I want to do is I want to sleep at night and I just want to be able to sit in my chair during the day and watch TV. That patient is absolutely going to love their reverse shoulder replacement. Reverses are good at function, but not perfect. And so I spend with every single patient, I, I, I explain to them what I anticipate I can get better and what I can't. Reverse shoulder replacements are very good at active elevation in front of them, so forward elevation, but not perfect. The average, and so I, I run a large registry nationwide for reverse shoulder replacements, and I have everyone's data. So I can tell you for thousands and thousands of shoulder replacements what the average forward elevation, average external rotation, average internal rotation is. The average forward elevation after reverse shoulder replacement done by very high-level shoulder surgeons across the country is 120 degrees of forward elevation. So if you have a patient who comes in who has zero degrees of active elevation and they're pseudo paralytic, telling them they're gonna get 120 degrees of forward elevation, they love you. That's a great functional gain for them. They're happy. They can reach the top of their head. They can get to the first shelf in their kitchen. But if you get the patient who comes in who's playing tennis at their country club and they have 170 of forward elevation and they're scratching their back and they, they think that a reverse shoulder placing is gonna get them that last 10 degrees, that's actually gonna probably make their function a little bit worse. Um, and so understanding where their function is and making sure they understand what I anticipate gaining from it really helps on the backside so they, they, they aren't disappointed with their outcome. Historically, reverse shoulder replacements are poor at rotational motion. And a lot of that's due to the fact that there aren't a lot of ways to regain internal and external rotation without a rotator cuff. In particular, external rotation is exceedingly difficult to regain after um, reverse shoulder replacement if they don't have an infraspinatus. So the lack of an infra infraspinatus in Terry's minor, um, if those rotator cuff tendons are torn, it is unlikely that they're gonna gain much active external rotation. That being said, there's been a lot of improvements in implant. That's something um, I've spent a lot of time looking through this registry and trying to figure out kind of optimal component positioning, size of components, direction of components. Um, and, and so there are things that we are doing to improve external rotation, even within the last year or two, I've been shocked. And I have patients come in with 80 degrees of active exter external rotation with their arm at their side, when even four years ago, everyone just got zero of extra rotation. And so I think this is something that's gonna continue to improve as implants get better, um, but I don't ever promise that to a patient. Inter rotation is variable and a lot of that depends on the, the status of their subscap. So reverse place taken into our practice. And this kind of highlights a little bit of why it's because we can literally use it for everything. And so while the primary indication was rotator cuff tear arthropathy, we can use it for dislocated anatomics, the ones that are escaping out the front. Irreparable cuff tears, this has become a, a, a really big thing for reverse shoulder replacements. Failed rotator cuff repairs. And so it used to be re-repair re it two, three, four times. Um, I certainly am, am all about revision rotator cuff repairs. But in, in a certain patient population, you start looking at kind of benefit and risk analysis. If they've already failed one rotator cuff repair, they have a little bit of arthritis, they're 75 years old, they're incredibly frustrated at the rehab process last time, and you know that very predictably you can get them a good, if not great shoulder with a reverse shoulder replacement, but they don't have to worry at all about healing. It becomes very difficult to talk yourself into a revision rotator cuff repair when you know the patient's gonna do fantastic with a reverse shoulder replacement. It is now the treatment of choice um, for a lot of proximal humerus fractures. 
I heard at least one trauma surgeon say recently that he feels that all kind of elderly patients with um, proximal humerus fractures either should be managed non-op or with a reverse shoulder replacement. And that fixing elderly patient proximal humerus fractures really doesn't help anymore because reverse shoulder replacement gets you better motion and better function and you don't have to wait for healing. Certainly um, fractures that don't heal do well with reverse shoulder replacements. Failed anatomic shoulder replacements, um, being in a tertiary referral center, I see a lot of those. Um, they, they tend to do quite well with reverse shoulder replacements and even some failed reverse shoulder replacements. And so not everyone does a lot of shoulder reverses. And so the, it, it's hard to imagine, but the average of this, again, was another study that we did. The average shoulder replacement in the United States is done by a surgeon who does 10 or less a year. Um, and so it, it's hard to get good at an operation if you only do 10 of them. And you have to imagine those aren't all 10 reverse shoulder replacements. So, I mean, the, the majority of surgeons who do shoulder replacements do very few. Um, we're, it's very nice here at UVA. I mean, both Dr. Brockman and I do over 150 of these a year. And so it's something that the more of them you do, um, the better your indications are for it and the better you get at the surgery. And so the more predictable the outcomes are. Um, reverse shoulder replacements have gotten so good that we started using them in patients with regular arthritis. So even rotator cuff intact patients with um, significant bone loss, um, uh, you know, there's a, a number of other reasons why you might consider a reverse. There are some people around the country, and I'm not quite there yet, who have an age cutoff for, for anatomic shoulder replacements. You just say, listen, anyone above the age of 75, I don't trust their rotator cuff. I worry that it's going to tear regardless or it's not going to recover. And I know my reverse shoulder replacement is going to rehab in six weeks and feel great and already have 100 to 40 elevation six weeks after surgery. And so there are a lot of people around the country who have moved to just eight strict age cutoffs for, for anatomic shoulder replacements and just do reverses on everybody over the age of 75. Um, and so it's become a very utilitarian uh, procedure. There's obviously some downsides to it, but uh, it's become very important. This slide kind of highlights what it does. This is an older style reverse shoulder replacement, but I really like the graphic. And so if you look at the slide on the left, you can see this patient has arthritis, but significant superior migration, that kind of white arrow here that I'm pointing at, um, you know, not a lot of space between the greater tuberosity and the chromium because the rotator cuff's done. You can see after the reverse shoulder placement how much that um, distance has increased. And so the arm has lengthened and I would do warn patients about that, especially kind of my you know, needier patients who wear fitted suits and that kind of thing, they will notice that, uh, you know, their arm length changes and that their fitted shirts, they're going to need to, to get them uh, lengthened a little bit or get a different size. Um, but it tensions their deltoid. And then these arrows are showing how it changes the centered rotation. That gives them the mechanical ability to lift their shoulder back up. And then at the same time deals with the fact, you know, that they don't have a rotator cuff anymore. So no longer their humerus, they, they get rid of their arthritis, but no longer their humerus rubbing against the roof of their socket every time they go to bed at night. And so one of the biggest indications for me, other than, you know, loss of function for shoulder replacement is night pain. I get so many patients who's like, I can deal with it during the day, I get by, but when I go to bed at night, my shoulder kills me, I can't deal with it anymore. I hear that probably 15 or 20 times every single clinic. And so you can get someone sleeping better with reverse shoulder replacement in a couple of weeks. It's really a tremendous improvement for them. So here's kind of a um, typical case example of someone that I see for a shoulder replacement is one of my patients. So um, she's seeing me for a third opinion for left shoulder pain and dysfunction. She's at over five years of pain two prior shoulder surgeries. One of them was arthroscopic, one of them was open. Um, you know, she's a healthy lady, she's active and she can't do anything with her shoulder. If you look at her function down here, 60 of forward elevation, basically no external rotation whatsoever, really poor strength. Um, and, and you notice some atrophy when you take her shirt off and look from behind. Um, and so you really don't need much more than this AP X-ray to understand what's going on with her. So she has a significant amount of superior migration of her humeral head, basically no space at all for the rotator cuff. And I imagine this is what it looked like after the first surgery. And, and so, um, you know, for her to have a third rotator cuff operation is really not in her best interest. Most of these patients, by the time they make it to me, do have an MRI. I don't necessarily think it changes my management on her, but certainly highlights her problem. Her rotator cuff is nowhere to be found. I mean, it's re retracted all the way over to the glenoid. You can see evidence of kind of bony formation, a lot of prior anchors. Um, and so when I see this patient, you know, I, I talk about injections and I believe she had an injection or two. Um, and then at, at some point in time, I just say, listen, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but a reverse shoulder replacement for you is absolutely going to change your life. Um, and uh, th this slide, I include this just to show the atrophy. And so th this is a rotator cuff even that was repairable. There's so much atrophy in the muscle itself. You really worry if that's going to function and allow her to, um, you know, regain any active elevation. And so she gets a reverse shoulder replacement. You'll see a lot of different kind of varieties and brands that we use. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but they all have the same basic concept of 
um, distalizing the, uh, the arm and, and lengthening the deltoid and then medializing the center of rotation. And I remember this lady really well because she's someone who came back in two weeks. She never wore her sling. Um, and she had 140 degrees of forward elevation two weeks after reverse shoulder replacement when she'd spent five years not being able to lift her arm up and not being able to sleep at night. Um, and so it, it, it's a really powerful operation for a lot of people. The, the big hesitancy early on was just high complication rates when people, you know, when these were first being done, but th these have really been reduced to the same complication rate profiles and anatomic shoulder replacement. And so complications aren't a reason not to do these anymore. Here's an additional case example. It just highlights kind of one other reason why we do reverse shoulder replacements. This is a 66 year old guy who was a normal guy, you know, uh, you know play sports, that kind of thing. Um, you know, fell, um, had an injury, didn't do a whole lot about it and shows up to my clinic with an x-ray like this and uh, he doesn't even have a humerus anymore. So it's a like chronic proximal humerus fracture where the, this, this kind of scapular Y lateral over here on the right side, see the whole ball kind of fell off the back of his humerus. Um, and he hadn't moved his shoulder in, in months. Uh, and was just kind of avoiding going to the doctor. And you, when, you, when you see this guy, there really is no option. Injections aren't gonna help this. He either lives with his shoulder not really working for the rest of his life, which is an option, or he gets a reverse shoulder replacement. Prior to reverse shoulder replacements, you didn't have an option for this guy. You, you just told him, sorry, listen, you're just not gonna use your shoulder. You're gonna be someone who works at waist level and, and plays sports and does whatever at waist level. And then CT scan shows how kind of wispy thin all the bone was around there. And so we do a reverse shoulder replacement. This is a different brand, kind of a little different style, but it works well with fractures. Um, and this is another guy, of course, you only show your cases, they're doing well. Um, but um, I mean, he had probably 130, 140 of active elevation three months after this. And um, you know, he, he's someone who absolutely loves his shoulder. He's two or three years out now, and, and he, it's almost indistinguishable from his other side. And so um, it becomes, it's, a, it's a very powerful operation to deal with a, a lot of problems. Um, so I won't belabor too much since we're running low on time. Um, what I was trying to highlight with this slide is that um, the, the failure rate and the complication rate of reverse shoulder replacements was extremely high when they first started. So if you look at articles back in 2004, 2005, you're looking at 20 to 25% complication rates with one in five being revised. Um, that has changed dramatically. And now the survivorship um, of reverse shoulder replacements is equivalent to that of anatomic shoulder replacements. And so I don't use that as a reason not to do a shoulder replacement. Um, you know, if, if you do enough of them and, and you get savvy at doing them, um, it, it's really not something that you worry about. There are still things that happen. Um, the the glenospheres can loosen. And, and so, you know, this is still an operation where you're putting a lot of tension across the shoulder. If patients have bad bone, the screws can rip out, the ball can dissociate. Um, they can get what's called scapular notching, where the, the basically the metal tray rubs against the bone on the, on the uh, glenoid side. Probably the most frequent complication that I see after reverse shoulder replacement is acromial fractures. Part of that's the surgeon's fault, part of that's the, um, uh, the implant's fault. So this puts a lot of tension on the deltoid and patients with weak or um, osteoporotic bone, that can pull so hard on the deltoid that it can weaken the, the deltoid where it attaches on the acromion over time. And so acromial fractures do happen. I've had a couple, everyone who does them has had a couple. In general, the patients still do well, but they, they are pretty unhappy for a period of time when you have to put them back in a sling and slow things down. The biggest thing to pay attention to when you're rehabbing a patient with a reverse shoulder replacement is a new onset of posterior pain. And so every reverse that comes back to the office, regardless of where they are in their post-operative course, I kind of very casually palpate the back of their shoulder and just feel along their scapular spine just to see if they're having any pain back there to see if I can catch an early stress reaction. If he catches a stress reaction, you just shut him down, you back him off from therapy, you have him just do pendulum exercises for a couple of weeks until that pain goes away, you can consider a bone stimulator. And then once it heals, they're good. They in general don't develop any more acromial stress reaction. It's just that shoulder was probably a little too tight. It was put in there a little too tension and they find a new home and they're happy with. And so if you ever have one of our reverses with posterior shoulder pain or their scapular spine, definitely worth getting them in to see us so we can get an X-ray and slow them down if we need to. Um, and so what was the future of shoulder replacement? Like I talked about, stemless is certainly a new thing. This was one that we did a clinical trial for here. Uh, both Dr. Brockmer and I are doing a lot more stemless even than we were doing a year ago. I'd say probably one in three is a stemless for me. I think probably a little more of his, maybe even one in two now by now are, are um, stemless arthroplasties for anatomics. Stemless doesn't work so well for reverse. There's just too much tension and, and torque uh, stresses that go across the humeral side. And so people have tried it, but they in general fail by the time they get to the recovery room. Um, there, there's some improvement in glenoid design, like we talked about, you know, this isn't as important from, uh, you know, the rehab perspective, but it allows us to rebuild their sockets with plastic or metal as opposed to, um, you know, reaming away bone. And so 
we have all kinds of tricks, but um, if your patients ever complain about getting a CT scan um, before shoulder replacement, we do it for a reason. It's so that we can um, anticipate problems or deformity on their socket and then address that intraoperatively. And these are some of the newer sockets that we use now that have kind of these, you can see how one side's thicker than the other and they're called augments. We basically can augment where there's bone loss, we can place a socket um, to build that up. We can also do that on reverse shoulder replacements. I think almost, you know, probably three quarters of reverses I put in have some sort of augment to build up for any bony deficiency the patient may have. And then patient specific instrumentation is, is something that's um, basically standard in my practice. So all anatomic shoulder replacements, unless the patient adamantly refuses, gets a CT scan. It goes into the website that's provided free by the company. Um, and then I can basically target my center pin to correct all the bony deformity that I perceive based on a 3D reconstruction of their CT scan. So I can basically do the entire surgery on a computer and then they have a transfer guide that I can use for free. It's no cost to the patient that allows me to position the pin so that I can ream in just the right way and place the socket in just the right way so that I can recreate what I see on the computer. And so that's absolutely standard for me for an anatomic shoulder replacement. I'd say about 50% of my reverse shoulder replacements I do it to now. And so we even have GPSs where we can watch ourselves as we drill, watch the length of our screws when we put them in. And so it's gotten very technically savvy, but it, it allows us to take a, a somewhat perfect operation and make it even more perfect. And so these are all just kind of different things with targeting guides and everything else that um, you know companies and people that like to do research are working on to try to make this a more perfect operation. Um, and then I, outpatient TSA, I include this. There's actually an old slide, um, but uh, outpatient shoulder replacement is here to stay. So I wrote the first paper that got published on um, outpatient shoulder replacements. Um, and across the country, it's become more common. And now at UVA, it is the pathway. And so unless it's an unhealthy patient, I'm, I'm instructing them to anticipate going home that day unless they have uh, you know, some sort of medical issue. So that's it. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Awesome, Brian. Thank you. So I got a couple of questions from the crowd. So uh, Matt Connor asks, without the protocol in front of me, can you review the restrictions slash guidelines to external rotation to protect your subscap? And also, is an okay for internal rotation isometrics at six weeks? Yes. So I'll answer the second part first. At, at six weeks, although the subscap is probably not perfectly healed, isometrics are perfectly fine at six weeks. Um, for the first six weeks, though, as far as restricting range of motion, uh, it's kind of a progressive increase in extra rotation. Without the rehab protocol in front of me, I don't remember the exact degrees, um, but it's in the ballpark of somewhere between 30 and 40 degrees of passive external rotation, and then really avoiding much in the way of active internal rotation for the first six weeks for anatomics. For reverses, I have people in my study group that don't ever have them wear a sling, literally a simple sling until their nerve block wears off and then go nuts with it. Um, and so they, you'll occasionally see some rehab scripts from me for, you know, where I try to write in there and kind of sometimes it's a little bit read through the lines. Um, but my happiest patients after reverses are the ones who don't use their slings and, and try to push their therapy quicker. Uh, and so unless it's a patient with fragile bone that I'm worried about, or they, I'm really worried about, you know, something about their rotator cuff, um, it, it's safe to push them along quicker. I, I think we're, we're, we're um, costing our reverse shoulder replacements some of their active function by keeping them on the same rehab protocol that we do for anatomics. All right, so another question. In your practice or in the literature, are you seeing risk factors associated with failed arthroplasty like smoking or the overall quality of tissue? Um, and is there technology there to reinforce the repair for those with poor tissue? Good question. So I have a slide for another talk that I should put in here where I, I basically put in a photograph of every single research paper that I've published on risk factors for complications after shoulder replacement. And it was like 20 some odd papers that went through all the things that could be the patient's fault um, for why their shoulder replacement does, uh, doesn't do well or why they have problems with it. Smoking is not good, um, but different than the knee and the hip, I haven't seen a huge rate of subscap failure um, due to patients who smoke. And so I do counsel them. I, I do prefer that they don't do it. When we're in the world of reverse shoulder replacement, uh, a smoker with a, a large cuff makes me lean more towards doing a shoulder replacement than doing a cuff repair on them because I don't need their tissue to heal. Um, and, and so um, I, ev literally everything you can think of has been linked to inadequate outcomes or poor outcomes of shoulder replacement. Um, obesity has, although again, I don't have strict BMI cutoffs like they do for hip and knee because there's different stresses across the shoulder. Um, smoking has been, de been definitively linked to poor outcomes, um, but most of them are not interestingly instability or rotator cuff failure. In general, it's more just kind of poor patient reported outcomes, increase infection rates. Those are the things that we, we worry more about. Was there another part to that question, Winston? Is there a technology there to, re to reinforce the repair in those with poor tissue? 
Yes. Um, and so subscap repair, there's a lot of different tricks in doing it. Um, we have a lot of different suture configurations we do. Um, we are now getting to the point where I've spent some time in the lab working on different type of suture anchor based repairs as opposed to drilling holes, um, kind of repairs for the subscap when we're doing the anti shoulder replacement, more similar to the type of repairs we do for rotator cuffs on the top of the shoulder. And so we've always, you know, do these elaborate kind of double row repairs when we repair a rotator cuff on top of the shoulder. Then we do a shoulder replacement and we tie a few knots with a, some kind of standard stitches because that's the way we've always done it. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've, we're working on developing some double row repairs and other things. And, um, um, and so I think there's more to come for that. Um, and then also, you know, for reverse shoulder replacement, um, kind of improving the, the surfaces for healing. And so I do repair the subscap after reverse shoulder replacement, but they're actually, um, you know, the, the implant that I use has little holes in the implant itself and then a blasted surface. Um, and so that actually kind of scars to the implant surface in addition to the bone, just to give it a better chance of healing. I don't worry too much for the healed or not for reverse, but um, we're still working on making it heal. So for your active patients, what do you typically tell patients about realistic functional outcomes, especially overhead sports like tennis? Um, so that is a great question. And there's actually a really good paper. It's out of HSS that looks at return to sport after shoulder replacement. They've done it for both anatomic and reverse shoulder replacement. Um, the return to sport for um, pretty much all sports overall after anatomic shoulder replacement is fantastic. Um, that does not mean that they're pitching a fastball and doing that kind of thing, but swimming, which is a big thing a lot of patients like doing, golf, um, tennis, all of those sports have an extremely high rate of return to sport. Um, I, that does go into my decision tree a little bit about what type of arthroplasty to offer a patient if I'm on the fence between the two. Um, certainly a patient who plays golf or tennis, that kind of these sports that require more rotation in their shoulder, I'm definitely trying and hoping that I can do an anatomic shoulder replacement for them. While it'll take them a little longer to get back to their sport, they're gonna have better rotational motion and they're gonna be happier. Do I have patients that go back to playing golf and tennis after reverse shoulder replacement? Absolutely. I have patients who it is indistinguishable which shoulder that I've done the reverse shoulder replacement on where they have completely normal motion, but that's not something that I promise patients and I warn them about the possibility. Awesome. Well, any other questions from the crowd? Um, <clears throat> while we're closing this out, I wanted to ask a quick question. I have this poll I want to launch uh, for our next topic. So we've got some, some different people who volunteer to do topics. And so this is the next topic we'll be talking about during our next visit. I don't know if that poll is coming up on your screen or not. It's but there. I see it. Just take a look. Uh, I know there's been some of these have been requested by you all. Some of these have been um, requested by faculty. So if there's a specific thing you guys want to talk about at this, at this uh, venue, I know that my faculty are way into this discussion, so please let me know so that I can make this productive and constructive. There's over 40 people attending to this session tonight. And so again, I'll put this back on the YouTube channel as we discussed in the past. Um, interesting group of, uh, of answers here. So I'm always interested in seeing what you guys have. And just to give Brian a shout out, Dr. Warner, um, he's like me in that he cares so much about his patients. I'm sure that if ever there's a patient you're seeing of his, um, or you want to refer to him, he's well, he welcomes uh, collaboration with the therapist. He welcomes direct contact. Um, if you have questions about his protocol or about a patient specifically, um, he's, one of the, he's one of the doctors out there that I know just, he's obsessed with his patients, with their outcomes and how well they do. And he's, always, he's also obsessed about making his surgeries better. So um, you know, please uh, you know, communicate with us and, and, and let us know how we're doing as, as surgeons and how we can and help the community better as far as educating and as far as taking care of our patients. So yeah, please, please email me. I love getting emails. And for those of you here, I don't have everyone's name up here that do email me. Um, I'm uh, pathologically good about replying quickly and um, I love heads up. So-and-so is not doing good, or I love the emails of, Hey, so-and-so is doing awesome. Thanks for the referral. <clears throat> There's a question about rehab or Hey, uh, for sure replacement. Do you mind if I push them along a little quicker? I love get, hearing that from people and I, I, um, you can never email me too much. I'll, I'll reply immediately. Yeah, pathological is the right answer. If I text Brian, I'll hear back within three or four minutes. I usually call his wife to make sure he's not been in an accident or something like that. And that's how fast he usually responds to text messages. So uh, anyhow, he's, he's very responsive as I am. Um, so again, a lot of uh, interest in rotator cuff, a lot of interest in uh, uh, hip replacement, a lot of interest in, in spondylosis. So I'll see, I'll talk to my, my uh, partners and see uh, kind of which direction I want to go with that. So I appreciate the help. And again, I'm going to put this on our YouTube channel. And, uh, and please, you all have my email address. Obviously, Dr. Warner was in the last, um, on the last email I sent out to the group. So if you have questions for him, you can email him after the show. So 
Thanks again, and, and you all have a great night and stay safe. Thanks, Brian. Yep, absolutely. Good night. See ya.